to the clip. <laughs> okay, so the subject of what we're going to talk about tonight is place-based education. It's my major, um, and I kind of created it as a way to help bring communities together. That's really something that I'm really passionate about. I grew up in this little town in Connecticut where, you know, we were outside every weekend playing in the streams. All the kids knew each other. And so when I kind of grew up and moved out into the larger world, I realized that a home was really essential part of who I was. And I wanted to be able to share that with kids and with people in my life. I wanted everyone to feel like they had a home. So I will start my presentation. I'm gonna have to screen share it. Okay, here we are. Okay, so place-based education using home to teach thoughtful students. So who am I? I kind of spoke a little bit about who I am. Um, grew up in Connecticut. And one of the main reasons I knew that I wanted to be a person who brings communities together was that when I graduated from high school, I went in a gap year and I spent a bunch of time in Norway living in this little farm with this family in the countryside. And this town probably had a population of, uh, this town probably had a population of mm, maybe 300 people max. Everybody knew each other. All the kids knew each other. We went moose hunting together. Um, most people didn't speak any English at all. But overarching was this huge sense of community and kids were learning so much outside of school about their community, about how to communicate with other people, how to create these really cool projects, how to work on the farm, build fences. And I could see that these kids are being raised in a way that not only taught them a really robust academic education, but also taught them how to use their education and their skills to create tangible, usable, effects of that. They could use their education to build something more than just their education. They could do something with it. And I thought that that was really inspiring. And I wanted to be able to bring that idea back to teach our kids in the U.S. how to take their education and do something with it and to create change in our communities here. Um, so when I went to college, I kind of jumped right in with trying to figure out how to bring communities together in that way. A lot of my classes were in elementary ed and environmental science and adventure education because I wanted that hands-on component. Um, so yeah, that's kind of been my journey through. And now that I am at the end of my time at Plymouth, I've had some time working in classrooms. I worked at Mountain Village um, down the road, which is a nature-based charter school, which was really cool. A couple of different places. Um, so I've really gotten to see a little glimpse of what my career will be like. And I want to share that passion for experiential and place-based education with the future teachers or professionals here at PSU, because I think that it's a really interesting tool to use in our classrooms, whether that be in a college classroom or a middle school classroom, elementary school, high school, maybe in like a summer camp program, or even, you know, teaching different workshops for people in like a science realm. I think that it can be really useful for all different types of people. Oop. Okay, so what is place-based learning? Place-based learning integrates social science education um, and environmental science. It really has this heavy focus on relevance in a truly place-based school. You're seeing a school that doesn't seem to have walls in that the community is really heavily used in lessons for the kids. And in turn, lessons for the kids are spilling out into the community to create change in really interesting, meaningful ways. So an example of this could be a community garden that the children start. And I think that it's interesting that we can teach all these different common core standards and science standards and really rigorous academic education through these projects. For example, if you're, growing a garden, a school garden, you can measure how plants are growing. That's a really interesting way to, you know, work on graphing, work on addition, subtraction, fractions. When you have these projects, they kind of become the vessel to teach academic information in a way that makes it feel like it's worth something to the kids especially. And they can come to school every day knowing that they're contributing to doing something with their education. I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, so place-based ed 
appears in lots of different places. We see it in public schools. We see it in democratic schools. Montessori Waldorf are really popular um, schools where place-based education is occurring. But I think that the public school approach can be really fascinating because the country is full of public schools. And I like that that gives everyone access to it because private schools cost money and sometimes they can be hard to get into. And I think that everyone should have a connection with their community. So I think that that's a really interesting aspect of place-based education. So I have a video for all of you and I'm gonna try and share it. <laughs> it is about a public school in Maryland and some of the place-based programming they're doing there. Because I thought that the clearest way to see how it works is to actually see children kind of doing some lessons in that way. So I'm gonna play for you. Let's see. Okay. All right, can everybody see this? Okay, good. Connecting their learning with what's happening here in their own backyard. They're constantly engaged in it. They're thinking about what they're doing and why they're doing it and how it impacts a bigger picture. For us, place-based learning is using the environment as the tool, using our place as our tool for learning. Here we go. Everybody's ready. When you use your place, everything that the kids are doing becomes relevant and real. They see it. They can put their hands on it. It doesn't matter if you have a stream or woods. It can be in the middle of the city. Just ask the kids, ask the parents. They'll tell you where all the little cool little nooks and crannies are in the neighborhood that you could be utilizing. Wetland. Wetland. Hemlock forest. Hemlock forest. What's in your backyard? What's in the environmental laboratory that's out there? Let's talk about habitats. Let's talk about animals. Let's talk about what your backyard looks like through the seasons. How's a meadow different from a forest? How's that different from a stream? We need to think about all the places in our backyard that we could set up some scent stations. Get your best sniffer on. Line up in front of Mrs. McCulley. So the first one you're going to smell is fox urine. Fox. Ew. Ew. Our scent stations were designed to attract animals. And they have molasses, skunk, fox, and beaver. And they all have had lots of sniffs. And they decide what scent would be best where. A trail camera captures images each time it senses motion at the scent station. So if we put the camera here, where would we put the scent? We get a popsicle stick and a cotton ball, and we put the scent on it. It looks like pee. Okay. okay, now you need to stick it down in there. We hang up the camera. Turn it on. Yeah. And then wait. All right. What do you think? Is everybody happy with it? Yeah. And usually in a couple days to a week, we come back and we look at the pictures that we got. What do you think we're going to see? Oh, cute. Another deer. Let's see what else we got. Hit the, hit the mouse pad. It looks like a mole. It looks like a raccoon. Maybe a raccoon. Now we're going into winter. What are some animals that we saw in the fall that we're not going to see? And where are they? Did they hibernate or migrate? That's the magic of learning, when they don't even realize all that it, they're learning and all that they're experiencing because they're just having fun. So if we're doing something science or social studies, we won't only um, get out a book and read about it, but we'll try doing experiments and going down the stream. And we do a lot of taking care of things, um, especially our trout. Let's see how the fish are doing. Well, we are studying how they grow up and what they eat. Doing trout in the classroom fit in perfectly with our place. We have the stream. Our kids love to fish. There's curriculum free on the Trout in the Classroom website. We talk to Trout Unlimited, and they said, absolutely, we'll help you out any way we can. And so we said, okay. 
we need a lot of help because we've never done this before. <laughs> Where do we get these eggs, you know? They came here as eggs, but some of them were already hatched. We put them in the fish tank, and then three days later after that, we started feeding them uh, fish food. We make sure that their water temperature is right and their water is healthy enough for them to live in. Looks like it's 7.4. Yeah, that's good. Every day they're collecting the data. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you've done the chemical study, now you can do the biological study. There are parts of the stream ecosystem that make that a good habitat for the fish. What are some of the things that we're going to find down there, hopefully, that we've had to mimic up here? They eat macroinvertebrates okay. when they're in the stream and get oxygen from the rocks. It's kind of like the bubbler in the classroom tank. I love it because we get to release them afterwards. We make sure that the stream is definitely healthy so that when we release our trout that we know they're in a healthy place. That stream runs through their backyards. And every day when they're down there at the stream and they see one, they're gonna wonder, is that the one I released? Nice job. That makes learning real. It validates it, it helps them make those connections. I think it's a deer. Because I think when you can help kids see the impact they can have in their own little corner of the world, then they can make changes in a much more global arena later on. <laughs> what I want to grow up to do is clean up pollution or anything that's damaged the world. What did we all think? <laughs> Does anybody with a raised hand want to uh, make an observation? Hi, I'm Cheryl Jackson. There's a philosophy of education that suggests we learn best when we use what's around. There we go. <laughs> okay, hold on a second. There we go. <laughs> okay, so what did y'all think of that video? Any observations about it or any thoughts about how it can be used or how place-based education is reflected in that school? No? <laughs> Do y'all know how to use the raised hand feature? No. I don't, but I noticed um, it was cool how they were using a, a stream that was in their community that they were all familiar with, with the trout. Um, that they could like, so that they have that connection. Okay, yeah, that's a really cool thought, huh? Um, so yeah, I think that's a really classic example of a community project that works really well for teaching across a set of curriculum, um, teaching a couple of different subjects at the same time while contributing to a larger project. So I'm gonna continue with my, um, my PowerPoint here, share screen again. Okay, so why do we need place-based education? So with that kind of example, we can see that place-based ed educates the whole child and teaches valuable executive function skills. So kind of like I was saying with my anecdote with Norway, it's teaching kids how to use their education in a functional way. And it teaches in a way that mimics adult life. Um, most of us, or I guess we're all in college, so we're all adults. And we kind of know that college is a microcosm of academic education but outside of college, learning looks a lot different. It's learning on the fly to be able to be able to deal with problems that arise or you know challenges in the workplace and stuff like that. We're constantly learning outside of the traditional academic, you know, teacher lecturer mode. And so I think that having that kind of included in a, ch a child's younger education allows them to be able to work with that style of education and to be able to teach themselves into the future. Um, and then Play Space Ed also gives children a voice in the classroom and kind of see with the whole trout thing, kids are really excited about getting to do something like that. 
and it allows them to be able to take responsibility for parts of it. They can have a sense of, you know, I'm really good at measuring water temperature. So that's my role in the classroom. And it's empowering for kids to be able to feel like they have a place in the classroom community. Um, it empowers kids to be change makers in the communities and it helps children feel like they have a home. There's the popular saying that says it takes a village to raise a child. When kids are interacting with all these aspects of their community, they're really feeling like they're important in that community and that the community cares about them. And that's a feeling that can follow them into adulthood. They can know that they always have this place they can come back to. And I think that that's really important in the kind of global world that we live in today. Um, and place-based education also increases standardized testing scores. We saw that a little bit at the end of that video, but I included a, a report here. I won't show it to you, but if anyone wants to link, um, I can share that at the end of the lecture. Um, so it's the place-based evaluation or place-based education evaluation collaborative. And that's this organization that evaluates how place-based education is being taught across the country. So this report, this one came out in 2010, they do it every couple of years, looked at somewhere around 100 different schools. It took testimony from teachers, testimony from students, and also analyzed the standardized testing um, grades of those place-based schools versus the schools in the surrounding areas, uh, and did a whole big comparison of how the scores looked before and after place-based education was started in that school and also how those schools compared to other schools in the area and it showed that consistently the schools with place-based education were scoring higher on standardized testing um, and some of the reasons that it cites for that is because kids are more engaged in learning and also there are some outside factors like wealth or parent involvement in a school that parents are choosing to send their kids to like that um, but I think that overall, it's an interesting report that shows that, that there is some merit to this teaching style and that it really does have the potential to teach kids in a strong academic way. Um, so where is it used? So as I said before, place-based education appears in public schools, alternative schools, and everything in between. It's a pedagogy in that it's a style of teaching, but underneath it, there's a lot of subcategories. So we have different places like environmental education institutes that aren't really schools, but they're places where schools will go for field trips um, or they'll have homeschool groups go there or that kind of genre. And it isn't a school, but it's kind of a supportive organization. Then you have, I made a whole list here, we're gonna go over them. Um, but we have public schools like Horseman Elementary School in DC. We have the Teton Science School in Chewankee, which are both private schools, but they are really fascinating with the way that they're carrying out their education approach. Uh, and then we have, I included the Foxfire book series here because I think it's a cool example. I'm sure Matt probably knows about this. <laughs> it's a really cool example of place-based education in action. And I'll tell you a little bit about it, but basically what the Foxfire book series is, is there was this high school English teacher in Georgia, and he was trying to find a way to engage his students in learning English. So they decided as a class that they were going to create a magazine that recorded the uh, heritage knowledge of the Appalachian region that they were in. And it ended up being this huge thing that went global super popular magazine that had all these stories from you know the grandparents of the Appalachian Mountains because they were preserving this ancient knowledge at a time is the 1960s at a time where these people who were very old were dying off and they preserved all these stories that would have been otherwise lost to time. So if you ever want to take a look into it, it's a fascinating book series. But what we're going to do right now because I think that it's best when everyone is engaged. <laughs> I'm gonna ask that everybody takes one of these schools on the list that I have here. And I will give you all, let's see how much time. Hmm. Well, all right. I will give you all, let's say like five minutes. And I'd like you to look up the school that I have here and kind of look into it and see what their teaching style looks like. What do they do? 
And then we're gonna come back and I'm gonna have a volunteer for each school kind of share what they found. So then it's not just me talking, we can all kind of contribute as well. All right, so that'll be five minutes and we'll start now. So I'll pause the, hold on, I'll stop share here. Oh, actually you probably wanna see it. So I'll reshare it. Okay, so it's 721. <laughs> okay, there we go. So you've got the list. Five minutes starting now. Thanks, Matt. Does anybody want to volunteer to tell us about Shelburne Farms? You can just start talking. That would be wonderful. Um, I can go. Sure. It's a nonprofit organization and its goal is to inspire and cultivate learning for a sustainable future. And they care about um, young, it says, we care about young people having hope for the future. We believe that sustainability is grounded in, in an individual awareness and action in our own communities. Our vision is for a just world rooted in stewardship and community. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful So basically it's just a sustainable uh, farm, I thought, and I was reading more about it, like how they treat the animals. Uh, and it seems like a pretty, a really nice place just to learn about the environment and to better the community. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for sharing, Destiny. Does anybody want to share about the Horace Mann Elementary School? I can go on that one. Um, <laughs> Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> I missed you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I looked at uh, Horace Mann because um, I don't know why that name rings a bell. It's probably like a really popular name, but uh, I really enjoyed that their mission statement was kind of anyone is welcome in their school, um, especially diverse learners, which um, they talked a lot about how culturally and linguistically diverse learners are um, a huge part of their school. And I think they said one third of their student population speaks two, three or four languages, which was fascinating to me um, because it kind of emphasizes that the place-based education talks about that universal connection that every single culture experiences. So regardless of any language barrier that might exist, anyone can learn through place-based education as opposed to in a traditional classroom. The language usually is a huge barrier for student learning, but I think that was something that really stuck out to me for this one. Oh, well, thanks so much for sharing with a profound observation. <laughs> okay, does anybody wanna share about the Teton Science Schools? I can. Thanks, Julian. Go for it. Um, so it said there, I looked at the preschool specifically. Um, it encourages the students to practice physical and cognitive skills through problem solving, teamwork, exploration, creative expression. Um, it said they view their classrooms and outdoor learning environments as the third teacher, which I really liked. Um, I thought that was a nice way of putting it. Um, and it focuses on the interest, interest of the students. And they also often take trips to like outdoor areas nearby in. I think I actually don't know where this one is. Um, what does it say? Even Wyoming and Idaho. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's, I thought it was really cool that it takes them to like parks and canyons. Yeah, that is really cool. I think it's kind of funky to think about preschoolers like climbing around in canyons and stuff like that. But that's got to be so much fun for those kids and so great to learn how to like use their bodies and also learn like some basic education stuff when they're so little. Um, thanks for sharing, Julia. Did anyone, can anyone tell us about the Chewanke Elementary and Middle Schools? This was in Maine, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I can talk about this one. Um, hi, Katie. Okay. Um, so it's in Wiscasset. The Chewanke School is in Wiscasset, and I actually, they had a definition for what it means in Abenaki, and it means Big Ridge in Native Abenaki. 
which I thought was cool that they had that on their website. It took a little bit to find, but um, they had a little blog post about how great place-based education is for um, the time we're living in right now, where it's really hard to have classes inside, especially for kids that love to move around. So they had a really nice um, kind of advantage um, in which they already had the curriculum to be outside. So that was a really nice little blog post. They also have a whole like breakdown of what they do in a day and how it's um, really nicely spaced out for kids to have time to breathe and to do kind of what they wanna do. Like they had a whole independent reading session that I thought was really unique. They teach um, grades one through eight up in Wiscasset. <laughs> yeah, I know that's something that you really appreciate is having some ties to Native American heritage as well because we are on other people's land and it's important to remember that place is more complex than what we just see here today. Um, so thanks for sharing, Anna. Does anybody have any thoughts? Does anybody want to tell us about the Foxfire book series or what they saw on that? Anybody? Did anybody take a look at this one? It's kind of a funky idea. I, I'll jump in. Um, I didn't actually look at that, but I, they are near and dear to my heart from growing up. Um, we had them, we had them in our home and they were one of my favorite, the, the actual books, not the magazine, but the, we had all of the books and I still have two of the whole collection. I think my parents gave the other ones away and um, just a, a beautiful um, capturing of the sort of a, a time in history in this country, a cultural um, perspective. And I just found them endlessly, endlessly fascinating. And I did not know that they came from out of this sort of teaching experience and this rooted in, um, you know, student created work. I didn't know that at all. And that actually makes them to me even more awesome. But I have, there, I have a special place in my heart for the Foxfire books for sure. Yeah, I think they're really funky. Well, thanks for sharing everybody. Those are kind of some cool examples. Um, but there are so many examples of place based education, especially here in New England. Um, it really started with this guy named David Sobel, and he's a professor at the Antioch School down near Keene. And the Antioch School has a center for place based education and partners with a lot of organizations in New Hampshire and the surrounding New England area. So there's a lot of organizations all across the United States that are teaching place-based education, but they don't label it as such. But here in New England, we can really see that label appearing pretty often because we're so close to kind of the epicenter of you know, the official naming of place-based education. Because as a pedagogy, it's been used for a very long time. So I think it's interesting to be in a place where people know that they're teaching place-based education. Okay, so how can we use PBE in our classrooms? I think that's important to talk about because a lot of us are elementary ed majors who are looking into the public school realm um, where a lot of the time more alternative styles of teaching need to be passed by administration and by parents. And in the public school realm, it can be difficult to push things that are kind of alternative because people really expect a certain style of teaching from public school teachers. Um, but I just really want to focus on how place-based education can appear in such a small way. Um, so here's a picture of some girls working in a community garden. That's something that a lot of schools have been working on is creating community gardens. But even just something as simple as growing some plants in plastic cups in the classroom and, you know, watching them grow, maybe a plant that is common in the area. Like you could even grow like dandelion seeds, have the kids collect the little dandelion puffs and grow dandelions. That could be a really interesting way of engaging with the environment. There's all these little tiny lessons or units that can function as place-based education and not such a large way as a place like Chewankee might use or a place like the uh, Teton Science Schools. So we are nearing the end of our lecture. It went a little quicker, but I think this last bit will take some time. Um, so this is a game that we're all gonna play. 
Uh, one second. Matt, can I put them into breakout rooms? Uh, yes, I can create those for you. How many do you want? So maybe not yet, but we're going to do maybe three people per breakout room, if that's possible, somewhere around there. Do you mind if I keep going? Yeah, go for it. I have them all set whenever you want. Okay, perfect. So what we're going to do for this game, um, maybe you've played it before, but it's kind of funky to try and think of a game that we can play with a bunch of people through Zoom because we're not in person. But how it's going to work is we're going to take a minute and you'll see why I give you such a short amount of time in a moment, but we're all going to go, we're going to grab something in our surrounding area that represents something that we learned today about place-based education or something we'll take away from it, or maybe an idea for how we might include it in our own careers and our own kind of purpose as people in the world. I know a lot of you are teachers, but a lot of you also are not. But I think that hopefully everyone can find something to take away from today to remember as something that they can keep in their mind moving into the future. Um, let's see. So an example that I could use is I have my face mask <laughs> and I maybe would share with my partners in my group that I will remember that place-based education works really well um, for the time of COVID because we are all, out, or a lot of it's outside. And so hands-on stuff outside works really well when we can't be in classroom spaces. So that would be a takeaway for me. So let's take one minute. <laughs> Everybody go find your item. And then we'll break you into breakout rooms and we'll have a little bit of time to chat with your breakout room people about what your item is and why it's important to you. All right, so it's one minute, starting now. Okay, Matt, ready for breakout rooms? Uh, give me one sec, just because some people have left, so I need to recreate the number. Sure. Okay, we have breakout rooms randomly assigned. Let me know when you're ready, Katie. Okay. Um. That's like two minutes, so we can go now. Okay. All right. So everybody should have been invited to their rooms. And Katie, I had to have you in one too, but you can go or not. Share. Thank you. Does anyone have anything they want to share about what their group talked about? Was it kind of funky to meet people from a lot of different genres of PSU? Yeah, Nancy's nodding. Yeah, Julia's got the thumbs up. Yeah, I think it's cool. We very seldom have activities like this where we're all from different genres, which I think is pretty funky. A lot of the strength of interdisciplinary studies is that we're working together across disciplines to create really powerful ways to solve the problems that we see in the world around us. Um, so I'm really thankful that all of you came. And if 
I could have one key takeaway. I think we'll end a little early, <laughs> but if I could have one key takeaway that I'd like all of you to remember is that there are so many ways to make a change in the world around us. And there are so many ways to teach kids and there are so many ways to reach people. And that some of our most powerful ways of doing that are through community and people and how we can share the natural and societal world that's around us with kids. And if we can show kids the beauty of the world and the complexity of nature, then they can feel like they have a part in that and they can feel like they have the power within them to make change in that. And so I think the concept of nature and culture as the third teacher is really what I would like everyone to remember is that we are all such fantastic teachers and such capable people, but there are other things in the world that can teach kids as well. And that experiences sometimes can be a powerful way of learning as well. And that's all I've got for all of you. Thanks so much for everybody coming. And it was great to see all of you. So I hope you have a fantastic night. Thank <laughs> Thanks for participating in my capstone project. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Great job. It was great to see you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Katie, we can archive any resources and stuff you want to put up um, on a page for this event on the CoLab website, so people can access like the link to the report you had and all. Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.